Please turn with me to Exodus chapter 14. Now, let me just quickly run through the history that has immediately preceded this chapter. Moses, under protest, was sent back by God from 40 years of exile in the wilderness as a shepherd, and he was sent back to Egypt to command Pharaoh to let his people go. And he said, I've come to bring you to the land I promised. And he said, I will bring you to the promised land. Now that was featured. It was a time now that God was going to fulfill his promise that he had given to them through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he was going to bring them to their own land in Canaan and give it to them. So he came to his people, and of course they were slaves, they were not organized in any way, and he told them that God had sent him to deliver them and bring them and fulfill his promise. And they practically laughed at him. So God began to work ten great miracles that were designed to bring the most mighty nation of the world at that time to its knees and force Pharaoh, mighty Pharaoh, to let them go. And by the way, they had mightiest army in the world at that time. So God began to bring one miraculous judgment down on Egypt after another until he reached the tenth judgment, another miracle, where he warned through Moses, he warned Pharaoh, that since he wouldn't listen, he was going to bring a judgment on them wherein the firstborn of every family was going to, going to drop dead. Pharaoh hardened his heart, and after he had seen all of these mighty miracles before him, the Nile River turning to blood, grasshoppers coming in, devouring the whole nation's grain, all kinds of things, frogs by the millions coming in, so forth. All of these things he worked to bring them to their knees, and this was the tenth judgment that he worked. And when that happened, Pharaoh called Moses in, told them to leave, take their people, their cattle, and, and leave. Just get out of my country. All right, all of that has happened. Now, I want you to realize what a miracle that was. Finally, the mighty Pharaoh lets these slaves go. They had no army, but God brought that nation to its knees with one miracle after another, and they saw it. And they were so anxious for him to go that every Egyptian gave them all the gold and jewelry that they had to help get them out of there. Now, that's what happened. And here, you know, God sets up tests for his people. You know, the only way that faith grows is by exercise. For instance, the only way muscles grow is if you exercise them. But not just exercise. If you want muscles to grow, you have to push that muscle to the limit of its present endurance. And once you reach that plateau, you get stronger, and then you have to push for that layer of strength. You have to push it until you reach its limit of endurance. And that's the way muscle tissue grows. Faith is like that. In order for our faith to grow, God has to test us to the limit of our present ability to trust him. Now, if God hadn't sent you any trials yet, cheer up. you will soon have the glorious opportunity to trust him. But you know, you shouldn't dread that because it's exciting to see God work when you're in a hopeless situation and God is right there with you and seeing him who is invisible take and take control. I've seen that time after time after time in my life. And you haven't lived yet as a Christian until you get to that point where 
you believe a promise of God despite what your eyes see, despite what your ears hear, what you feel. You go by the word of God alone against every other evidence. If God says one thing, that's it. And thank God, most of the time I do it. Not always, we're human. And then I have to have a refresher course on the trial and the trial and the trial. But, you know, I'll get back to just, hey, you said it, Lord. Now I'm going to sit here and stare up at you until you do this, Lord, because you said so and you can't break your word. That's boldness, and that's what God loves. He, he loves you to argue with him on the basis of his word. You know that? Nothing God loves more than when you go to God, you have a promise, you say, God, you got to do it. You can't let me down because you promised, and you never can go back on your word. Well, I tell you, if you heard some of the conversations I've had with God, well, here's this bunch of of rowdy slaves and Moses has them all out there in the wilderness and he's leading them and now we come to Exodus chapter 14 verse 1 now the Lord spoke to Moses saying tell the sons of Israel to turn back and camp before Pihahira between Migdal and the sea you shall camp in front of Balsaphon opposite it by the sea now Moses was leading the people out of Egypt. And when they got to the border of Egypt, going into the Sinai, there was a road that just went straight on to the promised land. And when they got there, God said, turn around and go back. And even worse than that, he said, and go north. Go along that, it's now got the Suez Canal going south of it, but there was a long strip of sea that came in from the Mediterranean that came into Egypt. And he said, I want you to go along that long neck of sea from the Mediterranean. And I want you to go to this special place. Well, he led them to a place where there's a little hill on the south, a little hill on the north. And he moved them in there. And they were kind of like in a cul-de-sac with their back to the Red Sea. Not a good place to be. To be in a cul-de-sac with no escape route. Who led him there? Why? He wanted to see if those knuckleheads had put together the fact that they had watched him work one supernatural act after another and break the back of the mighty Egyptians and free them without an army. He wanted to see if they could take that and apply it to a new situation and say, well, if God did that, he can take care of this. Because after all, the promise that was continually repeated to them is God is going to deliver you and he's going to take all of you to the promised land and give it to you just as he promised. So they had a promise that he was going to do it. He didn't say, I'm going to get you wiped out and a few of you will get there. He said, no, I'm going to bring you all there. And he backed it up by all of the miracles he had done to get them out of Egypt. Got the picture? I'm going to use something I think I've used it before, but I want you to remember this. God wants us to learn spiritual geometry. And I mean by that, that it's like a right triangle. Do you know that if you know any two parts of a right triangle, you can figure out all the unknowns? For instance, if you know the length of the base of the triangle and you know the angle of the hypotenuse, you can figure out every other dimension of a right triangle. If you know the height of a right triangle and the base of a right triangle, you know that those measurements, you can figure out how long the hypotenuse is. That's X. All right, here's spiritual geometry. If you know that you've been saved by believing in Jesus Christ, that's the base. 
And the height of the right triangle, spiritually speaking, is the various times you've trusted the Lord and he has come through. All right, if you know the base and the height, you can figure out X, which is the new trial of your faith, the hypotenuse. But most Christians suffer from a poor memory, don't we? All right, let's see what happens. 